Okay, so what shall we talk about? So we sit here for one hour, we're here for one hour, one little hour, and we're gonna think about a few things. So we can use some tools, even if it's 1% of it, to help us know our minds, develop our marvelous qualities and be a benefit to others. That's the bottom line, okay? So, I don't know what to talk about. You have to tell me. Somebody ask a question. Come on. We'll make it like a question and answer session. Talk to me. Anything. Something's on your mind. Something's on your mind. Anybody who's got something on their mind, speak it out. People. You can be your own therapist. That's what the title says, yeah. Why? What's the, is that a statement or a question? It's, a, it's not a question. It's a team. It's the, <laughs> I know when you're in Rubina, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> With my English. <laughs> oh, darling. Where are you, Francisco? Where are you? Mexico City, Veracruz, Jalapa, Veracruz. Oh, okay. Well, so you're sort of asking, what does it mean? Is that what you're asking? Yes. No? Yes. No, we, 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 we think we talk about uh, your teachings. It's about we can uh, be our, our own therapist. Yes. This is the... This is the teachings for today, I think so. I know, but it's the, it's the title we give to every Sunday teaching. Ah, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. It's our, our first time, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's not very good. Okay, then we'll, now we will talk about it. We'll be very specific. So the title today for our series called Be Your Own Therapist is "Be How to Be Your Own Therapist. So it's a very good point. Thank you, Francisco. Oh, well, thank you. We'll talk about it. Well, it's actually paraphrasing Lama Yeshe, my one of my teachers, my first teacher, Lama Yeshe. And he had this marvelous way of bringing Buddhism to, you know, at the time it was all these 1960s and 1970s hippies, you know. And so if you sort of look at the Buddhist teachings and you read the very traditional teachings, it really is very arcane. It's very kind of, very kind of old fashioned, you know. So if you, and I, when I first heard Lama Zopa's teachings, for example, at the same time as I heard Lama Yeshe's, it was like two different languages. Lama Zopa taught in a very traditional way. And I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. But Lama Yeshe had this ability. He somehow, I always joke and say he was like born a hippie. He was born a Western hippie. He just knew automatically when he, st he started to learn English, he had very outrageous English, no structure, no grammar. He just really understood he had extraordinary ability with words. And because you see, the wisdom that somebody who was a Buddhist, the wisdom that we are all capable of um, accomplishing is really very surprising to us. It's not the kind of wisdom we talk about at all in any way or form in our modern culture, you know? It's this extraordinary wisdom that comes from this internal job of literally being your own therapist, which is the job, actually the job of being a Buddhist. This is not evident. We all, we all think we know what Buddhism means. We all think, oh yeah, they sit down, they meditate, they're mindful, they watch their breath, they walk slowly or something. Well, if that's the case, I'm a failure. I'm not a Buddhist at all, if that's the case. But the point of being your own therapist is a really very specific thing, you know? And I think it takes a while to really see it and hear it. So thank you very much for pointing it out. Let's talk literally what it literally means. So, of course, Lama's first point, because he could see when he met Western people, everybody went to their psychotherapist, everybody had their own therapist. So, of course, he's saying, he actually said, you know, also be your own psychologist. So the emphasis is on your own. You don't need to go to someone else. But, of course, there's nothing wrong with that if we want to. And I think it's a very interesting thing to point out why we need to have someone else in the outside world who is called a professional person, why we need to go to one of them to help us sort out our mind. That is the, that is the method in our culture, and I'm not complaining. But what it indicates, does it not? What it indicates is we don't know how to look into our own mind. We don't know how to understand our mind. And in our culture, I think that's very interesting. You need to go to university and learn about the mind. Then you're called a therapist and then you can be professional and people can come and consult you. Well, for, it's sort of, for the Buddha, that's a very weird thing to have to do. From as far as the Buddhist view is concerned, it's a job every single human being on this planet should learn to do from the time they can remember. We should learn this from the very beginning of our lives. And this is not a joke. This is literally what the Buddhist approach is. So the Buddhist approach is, 
and this is, this is not how we think in our modern culture, that whatever goes on in our mind is the main source of our happiness and suffering. And given the very simple point that we all want happiness and don't want suffering, then we are the person who has to learn to become happy and learn to stop suffering. This is a big surprise to us. You know, so 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 the, the job of being your own therapist, the job of knowing your own mind intimately in a very specific, clear way, so that you can do the radical job of changing your mind, meaning of changing the way you think, changing your perception of the world, changing your interpretations of the world. That is the job of being a Buddhist. Big surprise. We thought it was watching your breath and being mindful. So it's so cliched. That's the job of being a Buddhist. So then, then the next point is, well, you think, oh, all right, I'll try that. I'll close my eyes and see if I can watch my mind. Well, we can. We can hear from the first second we wake up in the morning until the second we go to sleep at night, we can hear this mind raging on, un unedited, utterly confused, random thoughts coming from absolutely nowhere. No, we don't have a clue, and nor does neuroscience have a clue, and nor do psycholog psychologists or psychiatrists in our modern world have any idea where all these thoughts come from. We do not know why. Why would a five-year-old child think of wanting to kill an ant? Why would another five-year-old child want to burst into tears when they see an ant? Why do people get depressed? We don't know. The best we can do is look at our brain, which is fine, nothing wrong, but that's not Buddha's expertise. So Buddha is saying, one point, first of all, is that we bring our own thoughts with us. This is also a big surprise because we think we got them from mummy and daddy. No, we bring our own thoughts with us in our own mind. And so we need to learn to become familiar with what is going on. Of course, it's a hard job. My God, it's the hardest job we'll ever do. But this is the job of being a Buddhist. This is the actual job. So on what basis? According to whose model of the mind? If you say, I'd like to learn to play the piano, you've got to be precise. Who's kind of, what kind of piano? Jazz piano, African piano, you know, Bach's piano, which system? What system of music? You need to learn a system. You just don't go to the piano and start being intuitive and put your hands on the piano and hope music will come. That's a bit ridiculous. It's a bit kind of ignorant. That's like never knowing botany never heard of a rule, a law called botany, going to a ground and thinking, oh, well, I think there's a few seeds over there and a few packets. You don't know what they are. And you chuck them in the ground, crossing your fingers, you'll get a nice garden. That's just called being idiotic. It's called being ignorant. You need to learn the theories. You need to learn what kind of music and what are the laws of that music. You learn the theories of that music. You learn the theories of that botany. We call that intelligence. We call that science. But as soon as it comes to happiness and suffering, we become ridiculous. We completely think it's just we have these ridiculous ideas, you know. So even when, so first of all, we think the chocolate cake and the boyfriend are the cause of happiness. Sorry, Buddha says, you're wrong. They're partially there, but they're not the total cause. So when we start to even hear that and have confidence that maybe chocolate cake and boyfriends can't make me happy, then we start to listen to seriously what he says, look into your mind, but then we haven't gone far enough. It's not enough just to close your eyes and learn to concentrate. That's like watching a garden and getting concentration. You open your eyes and you look at a garden. You see all the shapes and sizes and all the different things growing. And you try to become mindful of them. You observe that shape and that color. But you don't know botany. You can look for a thousand years at a garden. You can even replicate a garden because you've looked at it so often. So what good is that mindfulness? That's, again, another way to be idiotic. You need to, you need to conjoin that mindfulness with intelligence. It's called learning botany. Then when you learn to see the shapes and sizes, you go, aha, now I can see the difference between a whir, a weed and a herb. So you've got to have the ability to look at your mind, which is called concentration, this brilliant technique invented by the Indians well before the Buddha. And you then need a proper model of the mind, a very clear presentation. And most Buddhists even don't learn that. We think, oh, yeah, I know anger. I know jealousy. Well, you do, but you only know the tip of the iceberg. You only know it when your body is involved. You only know it when you're shouting or despairing. That's too late. You're not looking at your mind at all. You're looking at your body. You're looking at the tears. You're looking at the feelings in your body. That's just too gross. We need to go beyond the feelings. We need to hear the thoughts, which now are completely unedited and berserk. So we've got to start to edit them and make sense of them and begin to distinguish which thought is what. That's the job of being your own therapist. And it's an intensely difficult job because we'd rather look at the boyfriend than our own mind. We'd rather blame the mother than our own mind. So there's a lot of jobs we have to do first before we even begin the job of being our own therapist. 
then the hard work starts. And then because Buddha's telling us that nothing is set in stone and your, your thoughts are definitely not set in stone, but you can sort them out. You have to learn to edit them, clarify them, sort them out, put them into reasonable sentences, coherent paragraphs. I'm not joking. Then you can start to understand. Then the crucial job is to learn to distinguish between the thoughts that are ridiculous, the thoughts that have no basis in reality, the thoughts that are leading up a garden path, the thoughts that are causing you suffering, and then distinguish between those and the valid thoughts, the virtuous thoughts, the appropriate thoughts, the reasonable thoughts. And you lessen, you stop believing in the first lot and you start to grow the second lot. That's the job of being a Buddhist. That's the job of being your own therapist. And it's only 18 minutes past, so I'm lost. I have to answer some questions now. So what do you think, Francisco? How did that sound? I absolutely... Uh, um, I agree with you. Sure. You agree with Buddha. <laughs> you agree with I Buddha. Try Buddha. I, I try to, to look my, my thoughts all the time. Yeah. It's Good. very difficult. It's very difficult. Extremely difficult. Yes, right. but then yes. when you I do try, look I try all the time, all the time, I try. I, I have like a, a little spy, no? Yeah, that's it. All the time, all the time. Exactly. But then I have to ask you a question. May I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Ben when your little time. spy sees the thoughts, what do you do with them? What's your next step? Uh, good question. Uh, right. This is the point. I. Um, I take my thoughts, I let it go. And I after, all of them. I don't don't all of your them. thoughts. You let all of your thoughts go, even the good ones. Yes. No, no, you the let good them go. ones. No, no, the good ones I is what do you do uh, with them. With my with my thoughts, I, I I try to understand what is the what is the the, the, the resort inside of me that uh, the, the, the thoughts becoming to me. Okay. So, okay. So uh, what if you have angry thoughts and, you, and your spy notices the angry thoughts, what do you do with them? What is your... What is no, your I don't, don't eat. I, I don't try to don't uh, not eat... Um, how can I say? Don't uh, eat my thoughts. Uh, don't don't. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice? Darle comida. In, 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 don't. How can I say? Darle comida. You mean your dinner? That's your meal. You're eating your meal. You eat. eating. Eating. Don't eat in my soul. Think uh, things. I try to. Uh, I understand. So you let, so you do, do you argue, if you have an angry thought, is who's that woman next to you? Is she your wife or your girlfriend? What is she? It's my, it's my girlfriend. It's my okay, wife. So let's it's say my your girlfriend. Let's say, now listen, hey, Francisco, let's yes. say your girlfriend is doing something that is making you slightly annoyed, a little bit annoyed. Yes. That, that's called anger, but a very small anger. What yes. do you do with those thoughts? How do you deal with them? I what let, do you let do it pass them? myself. I what? Let, my soul, I let it pass my soul. I observe, um, I think I uh, observe my soul and let you it pass. Observe the thought. And you let observe it pass the thought. So you, wrote, you recognize you had an angry thought. Yes. Then what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with the angry thought? Because if it's a thought, that means it's, it's like it's a viewpoint. It's an opinion. So do you argue with that opinion and try to see your girlfriend in a different way? Is that one strategy you have? I, I see the problem is, is not my wife, is not my girlfriend. The problem is the concept, concept that I have of anger. Yeah, good. Anger. So then what do you do with the anger? You stop, do you stop believing it? Yes. Good. Well done. You don't yes. eat it for dinner. The comida, I understand. Yes. Then, okay, then Buddha would approve. You are a valid Buddhist practitioner, Francisco. Did you hear what I said? I, know, I don't understand. That. I said Buddha would approve. You are doing the job of being a Buddhist. Oh, congratulations. Well, thank you. But, I wonder thank you. If she, but would she agree that you do it all the time? 
ask her. No, not all the time. She doesn't have to go. No, no. Ah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank That's you. Very very much. That's Thank being you. your own therapist. But the Francisco that we should, one thing is the point that Buddha is making, which is not the way we think in modern psychology. What he's saying is when we can learn to listen to these thousands of thoughts in our mind and yeah. learn to distinguish the anger from the jealousy, from the fear, from the love, compassion, we have all these different thoughts. We have to develop the, the ability to distinguish between the neurotic ones, the anger, all the ones that are based on me. So anger is based on me. Attachment is based on me. Do you understand? They are the neurotic ones. They are not valid thoughts, but they're the ones we all have and they go very, very, very deep. So you have to hear them and then learn not to believe them and even to change them or indeed let them go. This is very profound. But the other thoughts, the good ones, we need to cultivate them. We need to yes. nourish them. We need to grow them. And this is how we become a Buddha eventually. Yes. Good. Well Thank done. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. So who else would like to say something? Uh, then Rabina, so uh, Susan has a question. Uh, she wants you to uh, speak about how acceptance fits in. So I need Susan to tell me what she means by, I know the word and I know sort of what she means, but it's really good she spells it out. Thank you, um, Venerable Rabina. I, I often, um, I'm trained as a psychologist. Um, yes. And so I often think about uh, acceptance and, you know, Carl Rogers says, you know, we can't change until we accept what is. There you go. Brilliant. I love it. Buddha would agree. Yeah. So, um, so sometimes I'm kind of torn between, well, do I, you know, this differentiating between accepting. Um, so first you have to have the awareness to notice and then there's acceptance and then there's kind of moving towards change, you know, like. I, I understand. I hear. It's a, I think, Susan, it's an amazing, important point. And I think the key to understanding it from the Buddhist perspective is to understand this very clear distinction that Buddhist psychology makes, which I think we're a bit nervous to make in modern psychology because it sounds like judgment. So Buddha talks about thoughts that are neurotic, eye-based, fear-based, that um, negative, non-virtuous, that make us go crazy, kill each other, kill ourselves and all the rest. So it's not really meant to be punitive or judgmental. It's trying to observe the way we suffer. We suffer because of our crazy thoughts. Whereas we'd rather think we suffer because what our mother did to us or what our boyfriend does to us. We'd rather kind of get off the hook and not see what's going on in our mind. So often, but the Buddhist one is we can own those thoughts and know, yes, they're a bunch of habits and have compassion for ourselves. Then we can, that's the acceptance. I've got to recognize the anger is there and see how it breaks my heart. Rather than I'm not angry, it's her fault, it's his fault, everything else, you know? So when I can begin to own what's in my mind and observe the way it causes me pain, I mean, I don't know if that is that we're talking about ourselves here, forget about acceptance of somebody else, then I can really be rational about it. And it's not that easy and see how it breaks my heart. And I don't, I don't want this suffering. And then I would want to, I have to accept that it's there. Then I can, then I can learn to find the method to change it because it's, it's too painful. So it's not fundamentalist. It's not punitive. It's not judgmental. It's simply recognizing what causes me pain. And then learning to see how I can reconfigure, like I was saying to Francisco, how we can reconfigure these conceptual stories. And this is the key point in Buddhist psychology. Our trouble often is because we don't pay attention to what's going on in our mind until it's too late. I mean, I don't, if I come to you, Susan, and say, I'm, I'm really quite, quite, quite happy and relaxed, can you please help me? You'll say, we're going to go back home until you have a problem. But our trouble is we don't notice the problem until it's too late. I don't notice the problem until I want to kill my boyfriend, or I don't notice the problem until what I'm inert in bed with depression. And that's just a bit late. So the Buddhist analysis of the mind, which actually goes to quite subtle levels, based upon the ability to get this concentration technique that the world vaguely knows as mindfulness, this brilliant technique the Indians invented 3,000 years ago, it helps the mind to become laser-like focused so that you can then observe and listen clearly to all these conceptual stories, all these scripts that our mind writes that inform the emotion, that inform our body. And so we often wait till we notice the body, then we say we're having a feeling. But the real skill from the Buddhist perspective is to notice the thoughts that inform 
those feelings. And then we can begin to hear in a very articulate way what anger is saying. How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. Or depression, I am a disaster. I am no good. We get to hear the story these unhappy emotions are telling us. And then we have to see, not out of, not out of a negative or guilty way, but this is what's breaking my heart, you know, because we believe those stories. Then we slowly start to reconfigure those. those um, so we have to see them for, for what they are. But you've got to first identify a problem, then you can proceed to solve it. So I don't know if we're discussing the same thing, are we? Yes, yeah, so our, our discernment to identify the narrative that we've just yeah. hung on the top of and over that's the top. That's exactly of. right. No, that's exactly right, Susan. And that we all know takes courage because the instinct of the instinct is to put it on someone else. Well, I, I can't help it, or it isn't my fault, or he did this, or what do you expect of me? It takes courage to own it, because part of our problem, I think, as soon as we think that we own that we're angry, or that we own that we're jealous, we then blame ourselves and get guilty. So it's kind of, it's difficult, but this, that's just not helpful. That's just not rank. That's just guilt is just self hate, and it's an awful state of mind. We have to have some mm. courage to own it. And of course, the Buddhist one in the, in all the li Buddhist literature, there's really extensive teachings about how, and this is very encouraging, about how actually our real nature nature is sublime and very blissful and very clear that all these unhappy states of mind aren't integral to who we are they're not set in stone and that if we can identify with our marvelous potential then we'll have the courage to want to own what's there and know we can slowly in an evolution kind of a gradual way reconfigure the scripts reconfigure the narrative to become more optimistic and self-respectful and self-confident therefore more happy does that make sense yeah, yeah. I often look at acceptance, you know, when you're working with people who can't accept that happened. You yes. know, they're running against the acceptance of something happened in the past and then their whole life is ruined. So oh, okay, that's an interesting other discussion. That's no, that's that, no, so yeah. one I was talking about accepting parts of yourself, but I hear what you're saying. And that's a, well, I think it's the same thing. We've got to, mm -hmm. I mean, because the fear is so enormous, isn't it? We have to recognize something happened. But then I yeah, think the, and accept the, the, that, yes, it happened. Yeah, and what we have to realize is. I think this is also the similar idea in the same way that what I am isn't set in stone, that thing did happen, but we can re we can reconfigure the interpretation of it and learn from it. I mean, I've worked with people in prison for years, for example, and, you know, the ones who are really courageous, the nightmarish things that happen, especially in America, the prison system is so terrible and there's so much injustice and so many wrong sentencing. And, you know, you'd go mad if you're, you know, I mean, I've got people on death row who have been wrongly accused, but they can see that that did happen. They can't change it, but they can change the narrative around it. And that is, the, that's the miracle. If we've got the courage to do that. Do you understand? It's the hardest job we'll ever do, but that's what oh, you're trying to do, isn't it? That's exactly right, Susan. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It's so helpful. What else? Where are you, Susan? In Australia? I'm in Melbourne. Yes. Oh, good on you, girl. What's yes. it like? You still out? You wearing your mask still? <laughs> we we kind of go in and out, but um, basically we're we're pretty COVID free. So um, amazing! I can't believe it. God. It's pretty astonishing. It's incredible. I know. Well we're a very compliant society. I know. I mean, in some way, I'm not so, so rebellious and rude, Australians, but somehow, I mean, I know there would have been a civil war in America and mm -hmm. England as well. I mean, maybe the politicians didn't have the courage, you know, it's very fascinating. It's, yes, very, yes. it's very fascinating, isn't it? Very fascinating. Anyway, anybody else? What else to say, please, people? What else to say? Good point. Rena, so, Rena had a question. Put on you, Rena. Talk to me, Petal. Hi. Hi, Penrod. Um, Who's that with you? Who's that person? This is my daughter. This is What's Sattva. her name? What's your name, darling? Sattva. Sattva, I'm happy to meet you, sweetheart. You look gorgeous. Happy to meet you. Good. Go, Raina, talk to me. So my question is, in the Buddhist view, what would it mean to heal our inner child? Like, this is a very Western idea oh, about sure. healing the inner child, and how might that I think, I think it's very nice. Thinking. Yeah, I think if we look into the way we tend to be, since little children, things happen, isn't it? Traumatic things happen. And depending on our personality, we deal with in a certain way. So in my way, I was a bit of an, I was angry and volatile and kind of what people would call sensitive, which meant I was just, you know, so I would fight. But of course, and then another sister would deny it. She would push it away. Either way, we're both neither dealing with it properly. One of my sisters would push it away and I would punch and kick. So we 
we build up these old habits, don't we? And we get we become these very injured little people who carry around through life, injured and resentful. And then because we remember that thing that happened when we were five, it's like when you meet a dog when you're five and they nearly bite you, every dog you meet, you think they'll bite you. So if you have one lousy, one lousy relationship with a girlfriend at school, you keep projecting that onto, so we have all these old habits, don't we? So it's a really nice way to put it, this little girl in there, we've got to kind of get to heal her, to re- not just so much, we don't have to so much remember the events, I don't think, but we've got to just look into the mind and see the old habits and see the pain and see the old habits of anger and fear and, and try to heal the present. I don't think we have, to, it's helpful maybe to go into the past, but I'm not sure we have to because the present is the symptom of the past. So let's deal with the present, you know looking into what happened, looking, I'm accepting, as Susan says. And so there's many methods, but I think it's a really nice way to put it. It's totally possible, but we have to have courage to do it. We have to want to do it, you know, and know we've got this marvelous potential. Know we've got this, uh, we've got the ability to look into ourselves and reconfigure things. And slowly, as one of my teachers says, we can mold our mind into any shape we like. But we have to want to do it, Raina. You understand? And I think it helps to have certain systems and methods to do it. You understand? Thank you, Dolly. What else? Thank you so much. Good, Raina. What else, people? Hi, uh, yes, Venerable uh, Rabina. I have a, a question from uh, Laura Allen. She said, I just lost someone very close and very young. I'm trying very hard to accept this from Buddha's point of view, but I'm having a hard time. Darling, of course you are, Laura. I mean, I can't bear it. I can't believe it. I mean, where is Laura? Do you want to talk to me, sweetheart, or you just want to have it through the chat? Where's Laura? Are you there, Laura? Can't see you, darling. I am here. Laura, darling. So that's heartbreaking. Was it? A, was it? A, tell us about it. Just say something if you want to. Uh, she was my little cousin. Uh, little Thirty-eight. She was my cousin. Yes. Uh, when she was born, her mother was very ill, mm-hmm. so. I took her home with me. I was 17 years old. I gave her my her name and she died two days ago. So you were her mother, basically. You lived like you were like her mother, really. Is that right? Yeah. And How she had die, this darling? cancer. It was she... diagnosed How did she a die? year ago. How did she, she had, die? She was diagnosed with cancer a year ago. And did she die? How was she? Did she know about it herself? She died well. She was confronting the reality of this experience. No. She was. And I think that's the hardest part. For you, the hardest part. For me, it's the hardest part yeah. that uh, the I saw her three weeks ago because of COVID. I couldn't see her no more, and she was making plans with me to decorate things for next Christmas. Yes, and she has two young kids. She yes. was thirty nine. Yes, and they gave her five years, but she only lived one. But did she know that she had five years? She was aware that she had cancer. Yes, and she was aware that it was terminal. I understand. So tell me about how she was emotionally. Was she living her life nicely? Was she being a good mummy? Was she content? No, she was. She disconnected from her kids, especially from her boy. Really, darling. And that was very hard to witness. Because you think because she was so afraid, you feel. You said so much. And angry, angry. Angry, angry angry was she, darling, angry. She had no one, she she didn't confide in anybody? No, she was very angry. And and the problem is we we come from Latin America and her mother came to see her. Yes. Her biological mother, she's an only child. Yes. And she came to see her and what she was here taking care of her, she was also diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. And that's when they realized it was genetic. So the mm-hmm. whole thing was so tragic and it was so much so s- together. Yes, darling, I understand that. And I'm just having a very hard, like I'm trying to understand that her time here was done and she's, she just left her body and she's moving on. And that's right. But what is it? What 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 is making you so? Sad? I mean, she there's there's her, there's her children, there's her mother, and there's you. So part, what is the cause of the suffering for you? Do you think? How would you call that? What would you if say? I have to be honest and yes. open myself? It's my attachment to whom? To her. You were very close to her. You loved her. 
the idea of not seeing her again. I see. I understand, darling. So what are you learning from this? What? How do you, I mean, I don't know if you're a Buddhist. I don't know if you even use Buddha's views, but how are you trying to teach? How are you trying to cope with yourself? How are you trying to look? I'm trying to understand learning? that she came here with a purpose and she was done with it. Yes. So then, darling, and that's okay. That's fine. That's good enough for you. So then what about her children? Are you close to her children? Can you be close to them? Can, can you be yes, but, their friend? Because that's something positive you can do, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the way they handle her husband and herself. They what, darling? Both, what, sweetheart? What? Her husband and herself were in denial until the very end. I understand, darling. So the kids went from zero to 500. They I never told the kids their mom was dying. No, I understand. So are you able to be close to the children or the yes. father doesn't let yes. you see? Do they yes. love you and trust you? Yes. So I think the way for you to think, have your heart broken, be sad. That's perfectly fine. But if you're close to these children, how old are the children? Uh, 12 and 8. And they love you? Yes. And you can see them regularly? Well, not not with COVID, but, no, but yes. you can see them. You can you can FaceTime them, or you can yes, Skype. Them. Yes, well, sweetheart, I think you should put all your big heart, all your energy into becoming their friend and helping them deal with the loss. Become loving for them and kind, and just don't have to give them talks. Just give them love and affection. If they love you, they are very fortunate to have you, Laura. So you put all your energy, all your sadness into your compassion and you become their beloved friend and you love them and take care of them and let them and let them talk about it if they want to. Just become their friend, Laura. Don't discuss your own problem. That's your problem. You discuss, you be there for them. I think this will be very healing for you, sweetheart. Thank you. Do you understand me, darling? Yes, I do. It's a good way. You have a big heart and don't just make it. Be sad. Have your crying. That's fine because this is the way life is. We don't need Buddha to tell us this. Everything does change. People do die. There is sadness in the world. There is this loss. It's reality, sweetheart. So become very grounded about that, but then use all this energy of yours to become their friend. Are you close to the husband? Yes. Well, then you be his friend as well, darling. You just make, you love them, take care of them, just nourish them and be kind to them and lift their little hearts. Thank you. you understand me, sweetheart. Thank you. That's the best piece of advice I can give. And I think it will be very good for you as well. Thank you. Good, darling. Good, Laura. Thank you very much, sweetheart. Thank you. What else? What else, people? Anything else to say? This is a good point for people to bring up. It's so good. Yes. Greg has a question. Yes, Greg. Good, sweetheart. Where are you, Greg? I forget. I, you've, where do you live? I live in uh, California. Oh, you do? Whereabouts? Sacramento. Okay, honey. Talk to us, Greg. Okay. My question is, um, Freud says, um, talks about repression. Yes. And um, I wonder, can you tell me, explain, is, is, is Buddhism repressing those bad experiences? I think it's a really, I think it's a brilliant question, Greg. It's a very interesting point. You know, my feeling is the way we are in the world, and this is a bit similar to the question about the inner child, when bad things happen in, in our life, because we don't have many techniques, we're not taught this in our culture, you know, we don't know why we're born into certain families, we don't know why we have certain experiences, we're not taught about the intricacies of our own mind, we don't even learn all this, so we learn the hard way, and we get all the kicks and the knocks and the trouble, th the bad things happen, so depending on our personality, you know, like I said to, about myself, if, you know, my, uh, my anger was very quick, I was very sensitive, so I would lash out to people, and I didn't do much so much repressing. I didn't repress. I almost prided myself on not repressing. But in a way, I did repress. I repressed the hurt and I covered up my hurt. Do you understand? When you get very angry, you do that. So then I also did repress. But somebody else might be a quiet person, a quite sensitive person and not get angry. So everything just goes inside. So I think in our culture, we tend to have either you vomit everything out of your mouth or you live in complete denial. So I think that's what Freud is suggesting, the repression part, because we can't bear the pain. We can't de bear dealing with it, Greg. But my sense is the Buddhist view is a third option. Not We don't have to vomit it out because that hurts me and it hurts other people. I mean, look at the crazy world, the harm that we do to each other. So that's not useful. But then when we hear that Buddha says, don't harm others, 
then we think, well, I've got to repress everything. No, Greg, the other, we don't, we, neither do we repress and live in denial, nor do we vomit it all out. This is the other one we're talking, talking both to, to um, Francisco, talking to Susan. We have to become familiar with what the hell is going on in our mind moment by moment, Greg, and we have to see it ourselves and listen to it and unpack it and unravel it. Now that's owning what is in our mind, but the only way we think we can deal with in our culture is vomited out our mouth because we're not conscious. We have to become conscious of our own thoughts and feelings and emotions in this very clear, precise way so we can unpack and unravel and deconstruct all this narrative, as Susan called it, all these conceptual stories, and then learn to reconfigure them. That's the real job of being a Buddhist. It's very intense, but it's totally possible. And that it's neither repression, nor is it vomiting. Do you hear me, Greg? Yeah, we need great courage to do it though. It demands a lot of discipline, but we've got to know it's possible, and that's the whole way that Buddhist practice is structured. Thank so it's, repression is just as much. It's not a, repression is not as bad as anger because anger harms other people as well as yourself. Repression just harms you, but neither is useful. We have to learn this new one, and, and the Buddhist approach to it is very precise. And that I think is why, since Freud, we've got the psychotherapy system in our Western world now, which is brilliant. But Buddha's been doing this for two and a half thousand years, but this really sophisticated, clear way of unraveling and unpacking and deconstructing the thoughts and feelings and emotions at quite a subtle level beyond the physical feelings. And it takes time, Greg, and it does need guidance because it's quite a specific model. Am I making sense, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> you agree with it? You agree with it? Well yes. done. Good on you. Keep doing it, Greg. You look like you're doing it already. So you keep going, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Good. And if you're one of the quiet, you look like to me, one of the quiet guys. You're not, you're not very angry, are you? Yeah, that's, you don't that's chat and yell much, do you? Uh, no, no, no. That's right. So you tend to repress. Well, honey, you don't have to, but you you can. But you know, but but at least delight, Greg, that you don't harm other people. That's very special. Many people who get a bit depressed and repress think they're a bit hopeless. But you don't harm other people, Greg, and that is the most very special thing. I harmed a lot of people in my life with my anger, and so I harm me and others. You're only harming yourself, Greg. So you really pat yourself on the back for that. But okay, you, you can you. see your mind. Don't you worry and have courage. All okay, right. And never give up, sweetheart. Thank you. Good on you, thank Greg. You. Thank you, darling. What else, people? What else? Anything else? You have to ask me questions. I'm sorry. I've run out of petrol. Venor, oh. Robina, I have a question. Yes. Um, when well, I do uh, meditation on emptiness, I I tend to, it, it to me is very stressful uh, to <laughs> let go of my dear cherished body. Yeah, let you, go of your what, Alexis? What, what, what? Well, I have this hard time of just, you know, when you, you, you do the visualization of letting go of your body. No, I don't know what meditation is, you're talking about, honey. What are you talking about? The emptiness meditation. Which meditation? Which emptiness meditation? Um, where you, you imagine, you know, the, your, the cushion leaving the um, the building.